Thank you. Well, we con continue this conversation about uh, what we're calling the WHO campaign. Uh, the WHO campaign for us is who is God putting in our paths? Who is God putting in your path where you work and live and play that you might intersect with and, and, and eventually have a conversation that leads to opening up about your faith in Jesus, if in fact you are a Christ follower. As we begin this campaign, this initiative, we really have asked ourselves the question, where is God and, and where is Jesus as you look at his ministry? We saw that Jesus is a pursuer, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. He teaches us about that. We saw last week that he's in the secret place, which is the point of prayer that Christ never did anything without really going deep in his alone place in prayer. It teaches us not to really try to be ambassadors and spokespersons for Christ without spending time with him first. It's very critical. So today we're going to we're going to talk about something that I that I I believe that we could forget if we're not careful. Because when we think about being an ambassador for Christ, we our first thing is we got to say something. And so today we're going to look at the kind of the back end, what, what happens before we say something. So I'm going to start with this simple exercise. I'm going to ask you to participate robustly. Um, and you just shout out the answer. And it's just going to be math, just simple math. All right. So let's just let's give it a try. If you want to play along at home, just shout it right out there from your sofa. We'll hear you. So here we go. Ready? Six plus one. Seven. Excellent. Now we can do twice as good as that, I, I, I believe. I know because some of you didn't participate. Here, here we go. All right. Six plus one. Seven. Five plus two. Seven. Ten minus three. Seven. Five plus two. Seven. Two plus five. Seven, Seven minus two. Five. Three. Oh, wait a minute. Somebody <laughs> said three. Hey, you're listening. And you tuned in. It is so critical before we become ambassador spokespersons for God, we must be willing to listen. listen. So often we think the first thing we got to do is say something about God. The first thing we got to do is bring up a Bible verse. The first thing, but, but Jesus, when you look carefully, the very first thing he did was let me listen to what you're saying. Today, we're going to see a story familiar to many of us about a woman, much like these women in Africa. She came to a well. She came to a place of, of refreshing to get water, something critical, obviously, for our lives. We don't even know her name. She's infamously now labeled the woman at the well. That's all we know. And this is a story that an encounter, actually, that teaches us about some listening skills. And I think there's some principles that we will gather by, by looking at this experience one more time. I want to point out as we begin, we're in John chapter 4, and we're going to park there today. That's where we're going to hover the entire time, John chapter 4. I want you to be, as you begin to read this story, if you have your Bible, that's great. We have a, a, an app, a church center app for 360. If you, you get on that, um, you can type the word, uh, text the word seen to 97,000. You'll see some message notes. We put a little bit of extra in the message notes this week. Some questions that you might be find helpful when you're encountering people this week. Uh, so if you text that, you'll get, uh, you'll get the message notes. If uh, you don't have your Bible or you don't want to log into that, uh, get out. Just kidding. <laughs> You'll see the Bible verses on the screen. Notice how the story begins in John chapter 4 and verse 4. Now, Jesus had to go through Samaria. Okay, let me pause for a second. Jesus, what we don't read here is Jesus was meandering in a park one afternoon, had nothing better to do than go talk to a woman. That's not what we read. Jesus had to go through Samaria, to Samaria because he was on mission to go somewhere. Everybody in the room, everybody at home has a have to. I have to go to the gas station. I got to get gas in my car. This week, I celebrated the fact that I took my car down to one mile before I had to get gas. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. 
You're my people. I, I know some of you are like, I don't like him. You no, know, you're organized. That's fine. But I, for me, it became a sport. You know, and uh, I, I love that feature of the car. I did. I never had that before. You know, it tells you how many miles, and I'm just counting on it's accurate. But anyway, yeah. You know, but I had to get gas. So it was no longer an option, right? You have to go to the grocery store. You have to uh, go to work. For many of us, you have to do you know, all these have tos. And what I'm reminded is. That being a missionary for Jesus Christ happens mostly during the have-tos. It does, it, none of us can say, you know, I'm just going to set my job aside and become a full-time missionary for, for, for the Lord. I'm going to not have to go, go get groceries. I'm not going to have to get gas. I'm just going to set all that aside. The point of this conversation in this campaign is that while you're doing the have-tos, the grocery, the work, the the gas, and all those things, while you're doing those things, you are on mission. You are on the clock for, for Christ, where you work, where you live, where you play. So Jesus had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. It's an interesting pattern in the Bible that, that intersections happen, meaningful intersection sections happen at a well, this too. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus loved this. We see the humanity of Jesus. He was tired. He'd been walking for a while. He was tired as he was from the journey, and he sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour, which is about the middle of the day, okay? Middle of the day, Jesus is tired. Thirsty, as you'll see in the story, sits down, kind of waiting there. Then we begin the dialogue. This woman shows up. And again, if you, know, if you don't know much about the Bible, I'll just say that these two people groups, the Jewish people and the Samaritans, neither the twine should meet. In other words, they couldn't even have a meal together. They were not allowed. Their culture had divided them and segregated them. They were not even to talk to one another. So here comes this intersection. Jesus' team had gone into town to get uh, food. So it was a have to. They were on mission, but they had to get food. So they had gone, and now Jesus is alone. And he's sitting at this well, this this, uh, very famous intersection. Along comes the Samaritan woman. I'm going to put the dialogue up on the screen. And the exercise I want to do with you is I want you to look at this conversation, and maybe you would choose a different word than I did. But as I read this conversation, if we are going to train ourselves to listen intently, maybe there is just one word that would be a game changer in a conversation you're going to have this afternoon. One word. Because if you're listening and you're really listening in, you're like, oh, I, I caught that word. I caught what they said. I caught that one phrase that they said. I just find in general, you know, we, we offer, you know, Bible teachings and all, all that in church. To be honest with you, I think we could do better if we, we had sessions like, hey, we're going to do a three-week listening session. We're going to learn to listen better. Because I don't know about you, but in my experience as 62 years old, being on the planet, you know, for this long, I just find out people are not that great listeners. I don't know if, you, if you've ever noticed that. They, you know, so you say, man, hey, what are you doing this week, Steve? Uh, man, I got this really difficult meeting that's going to go. I got to travel to Cleveland, and that meeting is going to be super difficult. You know, I have a cousin in Cleveland. <laughs> not what's difficult about the meeting. Why is it difficult? What led you to the meeting? What do you expect to happen? I mean, let me find out about the meeting. To be honest with you, I don't care about your cousin in Cleveland. I was trying to tell you something that was meaningful to me and painful to me. Man, I got this really hard meeting in Cleveland. And some of you are like, okay, what meeting does Steve have in Cleveland? I'm not going to Cleveland. It's just an illustration. So don't ask me after the service how, how, what's happening in Cleveland. Ask me about my cousin in Cleveland. Then you know, I'll tell you about it. So I, I'm looking at this dialogue, and I thought, what one word? Would we hone in on and maybe again, you would pick a different one. Here we go. In John chapter four, verse eight, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, hey, can I get a drink from you? Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Now, when I read that, if you look at the next screen, I've particularly highlighted the word me. 
Why would you ask me for a drink? It's like somebody says hi to you in the lobby out there, and, they, and you say, why would you say hi to me? You see, it says something in that one. Why would you ask that question? Well, we know from the story that she's a Samaritan and he's a Jew. But we also know from culture that even husbands wouldn't speak to their wives, females, in public. They wouldn't even have that association. Number three, Jesus was by himself. She was by himself. Even in this culture, even for me, if, you know, if, if I'm going to a meeting, there's several people coming to the meeting, and there's a, a female on my staff, I don't, I don't, as a practice, get in the car with a female by myself. It's just a very highly sensitive uh, issue these days, and you've got to be super careful. Billy Graham wouldn't step into a, an elevator alone with a female just because of what might be said. It's a perception. So if we're that careful in our culture, move the, you know, the time clock back quite a bit, and that culture being together with a female and a male alone as a Samaritan and a Jew, and number four, they were about to talk about something spiritual. Women were not allowed to talk to men about theology. It was only reserved for the rabbis and for the males. So a lot of things were the PCO meter was just going, you know, pretty, pretty nuts at this point. So here's the first thing that here's the principle that I think is so relevant. It is relevant today more than it was six months ago. And it is, a, it is extremely more relative today in our culture than it was even a year ago. Okay. Here's the principle that Jesus, as we see this, that he's even there asking her, and she says, why are you asking me of all people? And there's a fifth thing. The lifestyle that she is currently living is not one to put out in front of people. We find out that she's had five husbands. The guy she's living with is not her husband right now, and she's not super proud of that. And so she asks, with all of those layers why are you asking me for a drink? And yet Jesus, knowing all those layers, he still does. Here's the first principle. We must, in this culture, in our culture, forget the culture 2,000 years ago, we must learn to listen to the person and not listen to the partitions. Let me explain what I mean by that. A partition in an office space to create cubicles is designed to be a divider, right? This is my space. That's your space. I don't know if you've noticed in the last six months to a year, there are those creating more partitions in our culture. So we have left and right, extreme left, extreme right. We have masks and no mask, vax and no vax, vaccination. And, and there's this cr the, the critical race theory that is not helping us. It is segregating us. There's segregation that is happening at a level that, like, wait a minute, we're not progressing. We've got a long way to go in a lot of these different areas. But we have those voices that are being amplified that are saying those with a vax are not right and those without a vax are not right. Those that are wearing a mask are right and those that are not wearing one. I can't believe you're on the left. I can't believe you're on the right. And all the time, God has called us to be partition breaker downers. And so there may be some people as a result of our culture that you would say, I'm not speaking to them. They're super wealthy or they're super poor or they're super intellectual and I'm not. And so I'm not going to do that. And so there are so many layers of partitions that just naturally flow in any culture. But I'm telling you that and probably don't even need to tell you, there are more partitions being created and if we're not careful, we'll look at the partitions and not the people that God loves so deeply. We're in a different kingdom. We're in a different operating system. We're in a different mindset. So whatever partition that is being created in your mind, God wants to tear it down because these are souls. They're not partitions. 
Listen to what we read in, in Jude. There's only one chapter in Jude in verse 18, 19. In the last times, there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the men who divide you, who follow mere natural, earthly, worldly, political instincts. That's their operating system. And they're setting divisions based on their instincts, and they don't have the Spirit of God. Listen, I wish I could tell you that I was free from this. But there are some times when I'm going to strike up a conversation, and the intersection is with an outspoken atheist, let's say. There's sometimes I'm like, uh, maybe not today. See, I've created a partition, and by my own human natural instincts, I've said no to the opportunity because I've gone with my own humanity rather than my own naturalness, rather than the supernaturalness that God can break through any partition. I've been with people like, wow, they're super intellectual. In fact, the very first time I ever shared Christ, I know I've shared it with some of you, the very first time I was working on a maintenance crew in a college. And uh, this guy was struggling with alcohol. And man, I got the courage up. I don't want to be in a Christian. I mean, weeks. I got, I, I got the courage and mustered the courage up and say, hey, his name was Mike. Hey, Mike, do you want to go have lunch? And this other dude heard me. And he, he was like this highly intellectual thing. And he's an intellectual person. And he said, hey, can I go to lunch too? And in my mind, I'm like, oh, no, I, there, he's going to ask me how many molecules are in heaven or something really crazy. <laughs> like what Michael, the archangel, was his middle name, the or some, you know, some big theological thing. I'm not going to. And on top of that, you know, he had this long goatee, which makes people, you know, look smarter. <laughs> I don't know what it is. You know what I mean? And the entire time I'm sitting trying to talk to Mike, I'm literally, I have built my own visual partition. I'm not even looking at this guy. You know why? Because not only does he have the goatee, he's twirling the goatee, <laughs> which makes a person even seem even more smart. You know, they're like, hmm, mm-hmm, and then twirl it the other way, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, I think I yanked that goatee right off your face. I trembled, I, you know, I, I, I'm afraid because I had set up my own partition. You see how that goes? You might ask yourself, what partition do I have that I've allowed someone else to create? Because you can't listen to that partition. I'm reminded in Titus chapter 2, verse 11, for the grace, the gift of God that brings salvation has appeared to who? All people, not all partitions. To all people. See, Jesus said to her in verse 10, Jesus answered her, if you knew the grace of God, the one that's for all people, the gift of God, and who is it? who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you, even you, living water. You see, she said, wait a minute, why are you asking me for water? He goes, oh, I would have given it to you, and I know all about you. See, I'm reminded today that God demonstrates him, his love for us in this Romans chapter 5. God demonstrates his love for us that while we were yet sinners, partitioned from God, he came anyway, and he broke down the wall. Listen to the person, not the partition. Here's the second thing. It's what we're going to call today gospel listening Listen for what is missing. Listen for what is missing. Jesus uh, encounters this woman. She says, you know, after he says, man, I, I would have given you living water. She, gets, she says, sir, you have nothing to draw with. You, know, you don't have a bucket. You didn't bring a bucket with you or anything. And, and the well is really deep. Are you going to like jump down in there and get water? How, how are you going to do that? Where can I get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and his herds? When I look at the story, the word that jumps out to me is the word greater. 
You see, because she was basing her whole life on religious ritual. This is, this is the tradition of the Father. Listen carefully. Every person, including us, if we're Christ followers, every person who is without Christ will continually look for something greater. If you come today and you're exploring God, you're here because you're looking for something that life isn't giving you right now. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. I've said it many times. Back in my day, we had to go to church because the neighbors would talk badly about you if you didn't go to church. People go to the church today because they're actually looking for something meaningful. People don't come to church just, just to save face in your neighborhood. So when we're in church anymore, I know people want to be here. And if you are exploring God and you're searching, and you might even know you're ex searching for God, you're searching for something greater. I was at the height of my career when I came to Christ because that delivery of a successful career still left me wanting. Though that desire for something greater is the petro, the fuel for consumerism. It's the thing that causes us to like, man, I got to get a new sofa. And then you get the new sofa and then you spill something on it. At least I do the first week you have the sofa. And then the sofa kind of wears out. And that sofa is not bringing you that same joy, that same exhilaration. So you got to get something else. And you got to get something else. And you got to get something else. That's consumerism. I got to get something else. And the reason for that, it is fueled by this discontent that only Christ can fill. So when we are talking to people, we are looking, we are listening for what is missing in their lives so that we can offer something that God gives that they cannot find in an earthly pursuit. Make sense? I'll give you some practical examples. Let's say, for example, you've just sent your oldest son to freshman year in college. Hmm, what could that be? And he gets super sick the first three weeks. And he goes and he's trying to figure things out and it's very difficult. And parents now are at home sending out their first little bird out of the nest. And, we're, and they're wringing their hands. Oh, is he going to make the right decisions? Why is he not listening to our advice? Blah, 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 blah. And in that conversation, you hear the person say, I'm beside myself. And then you respond by saying, well, you know, you're not, you're not actually by yourself. There is a God in this equation. You see, we're not waiting to say to that person, well, you know, Jesus died on the cross for you, right? I've got a cousin in Cleveland. <laughs> right in the same file folder. <laughs> no. A person just laid their heart and said, I'm beside myself. Oh, myself. I heard that word. Oh, let me tell you that God is everywhere. I know you can't see him. You can't feel him. And that may be bigger than your capacity of your bandwidth. But I'm going to tell you from experience, God is everywhere. And God is with you. And man, I've just found through a relationship with God, I see him more. I see him more. Maybe that would be something that would be helpful. You see how that goes? It's intense listening to that thing. We had someone this week that was in the gym. And this guy came up to her in the gym, and uh, somehow they intersected, and they began to talk about it. And I can't remember all the details of the conversation, but it, it, would have, it, it was a little bit, let's say, off the beaten path. He was beginning to claim that there were uh, the people on TV were not real, that they were like molecules or something. And one thing, one dark thing led to another dark thing and the whole thing was dark. See, for me, I would have built an immediate partition. I'll be over here on my bench. Why don't you get on yours? And we'll just, you know, but she didn't because of what we're talking about. Cause she's wearing a wristband to remind herself of like, Hey, I'm a missionary. She said at the end of this conversation, sounds really dark to me. Sounds like there's a little darkness. And he, and he goes, it is. It, this world is very dark. And she said, man, sounds like you could use a little light. And, she, and he goes, I could use a little light. And she said, well, you know, the Bible is full of light. You know what he said? 
He said, maybe, maybe I need to get a Bible. And you know what she said? Well, the next, I, I'll, I'll get one for you. And next time I come to the gym, you'll see me carrying a Bible. You see how easy that is? It's that listening skill that Jesus said, look, I understand you're looking for something greater because in verse 13, he answered, everyone who drinks from this water will be thirsty again, talking about the water in the well. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be on a consumption quest. You'll never be looking for something greater than God because there's nothing greater than God. And when you encounter the great God, you'll understand your search will stop. My ambitions change. My quest for a job career change. God reshaped that because I had found the God who made jobs. I had found the God who made everything. And when you meet him, even if you're here today, you're like, man, I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. Stop looking at religion. Stop looking at trying to be right and find Christ. Encounter Christ. He is the answer to what you're looking for. Jesus said, you'll never thirst again. Indeed, the water I will give him will become like a spring of, of water welling up to eternal life. Here's the final thing. The woman said to him in verse 15, sir, give me this water. Hey, who wouldn't take him up on that? Hey, I'll take a shot of that. I'll have what he's having. Give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Now, I looked at that and I thought, you know, the word that sticks out to me is the word here. Here was very painful for her. It was the middle of the day. Nobody draws water from the day. I promise you, these, these ladies in Africa, they don't wait till the sun is right in the middle of the day and say, hey, let's go travel 30 miles and get water. They're going to go early, early, early in the morning. The reason that she went in the middle of the day is because all the other ladies had already gone. And she couldn't stand to be rejected. And so she went alone. That's why she was there in the middle of the day. Here, for her, awful. Awful. Every day she went to that well by herself. It reminded her of her library of mistakes. Her bad choices. The rejection. The cultural marginalization of her life. Listen. Everybody sitting here today, everybody at home, we all have a here. We all have a here. A father's wound, chapters of abuse, chapters of addiction, abortion, divorce, death, job loss, bad grades, breakups, huge mistakes. If I shared with you right now my hears, you'd be shocked. And I'd be shocked about yours. Christ meets us at our hears. Christ heals us from our hears. So the principle is this. Listen empathetically to people's ears and for the love of God don't mention your cousin in Cleveland when they do <laughs> it absolutely is offensive to a person if they get to the place in their life and they bring up something that's very vulnerable. You got to connect empathetically right in that moment. You see, Jesus went right to it because he was able to. He told her in verse 16, why don't you go get your husband and come back? And he said, I have no husband. She said, I have no husband. And you know what he says? I know you're right. Here's what he doesn't say. <laughs> Wow. 
Not a good response. And he doesn't say you're wrong. He says, you're right. I get it. I get you're here. I've known you're here. And I love you anyway. And guess what? I'm here and you're here. God is here and you're here. You see, our here's, we think God doesn't belong there because he doesn't want to be there. But Jesus said, I'm right in the thick of your worst chapter. Even if you haven't told a single soul, I'm in your here. He said, I, I got gotcha. you. Have, you know a husband. You've had five. The man you're with now is not your husband. And what you've said is true. I got that. I'm just so glad he didn't say, how dare you? Move along. Get away. This is my here, and you don't belong. God, Jesus, like, this is my here? You're here. You're here? I'm here. We're all here. Now watch this. That moment was so significant that someone didn't run her over with a lawnmower, didn't bulldoze her. That was such a significant moment that she went back to the village to all the people who have rejected her, who had rejected her over the years, and she invited them to her here. Wow. Nobody invites anybody to your here. You don't, I don't. But because there was a healer at the here, she said, come back and tell me. I want to introduce you to a man that knew all my hears, and yet he talked to me, and he listened to me. This is being an ambassador of Christ. We listen first. We listen empathetically. We, we tear down the petitions. We see a person, not a thing, not a division, not a lifestyle, not an intellect, not an economic level, not fame, not lack of fame, not smell or no smell, homeless or rich, none of those petitions. We see the person. We listen to them because we love them. We must be different in this culture because this culture is just creating more divisions. There's no place in that for an ambassador of Christ. We find each other in our hears and we stay there and we listen and we love. This is being an ambassador for Christ. Amen. Yes.